Welcome to Commercial Conversations Over Coffee, the show where two college dropouts turned real estate millionaires discuss all aspects of commercial real estate investing. Now, welcome your hosts, Tyler Cobble and apartment guy, Bruce Peterson. Hey, happy Monday, everybody. If you're joining us live, welcome back to Commercial Conversations Over Coffee. Bruce, what's going on, man? How was your weekend? Uh, my weekend was good. The kid finally made it back. We've been waiting for her for a while. Um, she was flying in from New York and got stranded in the airport for a while. So instead of, you know, letting them rebook her, she got a, a wild hair, which is a fun wild hair. But her and her friend drove here from New York instead. So they had a two day oh, wow. uh, little road trip, but she's home with us now for the holiday. So super excited. That's awesome. Well, that's yeah. great. Uh, yeah, I've seen a lot of people. We, we were actually supposed to have a client flying in town from New York um, right after Christmas to come look at some some property. And they've actually ended up obviously canceling that trip uh, because of everything that's going on. So that's uh, it's good that she was able to drive in, though. Oh, yeah. They were having plane issues and finally got a fix. But by the time they got it fixed, the pilot had already been on for too long, so they couldn't fly for the rest of the day. So then they were going to have to fly out tomorrow or the next day, I should say. But, yep, they just jumped in a car and drove. Wow. Well, there you go. Um, awesome, man. Well, hey, today, you know, I think uh, what would be a good thing for us to talk about is, is, you know, as really the first episode, so now everybody's gotten to know us a little bit better, is let's talk about COVID and how that has impacted, you know, commercial and multifamily real estate. And then I think it would make a lot of sense for us to kind of talk about our outlook for 2021. You know, what's, what's next year going to look like? So what, what are your thoughts? I mean, you know, obviously you come from the multifamily world. So how has COVID kind of impacted, uh, you know, the multifamily apartment investing? Well, you know, a couple of different ways. Uh, a lot of people here are going to be more interested in buying and selling than they are going to be the way I operate the management company. Um, buying and selling, you know, cap rates have compressed because interest rates have fallen through the floor, basically. So they're super, super low, which is good when you're buying but at the same time, it, it makes prices start to creep up. And not always in all situations, but a lot of times, especially if you're buying something, a fully stabilized asset and you're buying it for cash flow, where my exit strategy was usually four to seven years in. And I would usually underwrite for five years just to you know establish my, my returns. I'm not having to carry that out 10 years to get the same return that my investors need in order to invest. So it has lengthened my timeline. Now, if you're doing a, you know, a deep value add, something that's going to be repositioned with a lot of value creation on the back end, well, you know, it's a little easier to do that because you're getting a big, you know, a really large sum of money at the end with a, uh, a fully stabilized asset. You'll get some, but not a huge chunk. So that's what makes the fully stabilized assets have to be carried out a little longer. Um, you know, the flip side of that is if you're trying to sell a property right now and you are in a loan with Fannie or Freddie, Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac, they have very steep prepaid penalties that are tied to interest rates. So if the loan that you're trying to get out of early, maybe, has an interest rate higher than it is today, that is going to very largely negatively impact you when you sell. Because they're looking at how can I deploy, redeploy the money that Bruce or, you know, the buyer, the owner is sending back to us early. Well, if I had a 5% loan with Bruce and he pays it off early and now I have to put that money back out into the market, I might only get a 2 or a 3% interest rate. So there's going to be a lot of interest rate loss or interest loss there for them. So they're going to put that on you as the seller. So I just sold a property. Uh, and at the time that I bought it in 2016, it was a great interest rate. It was 4.35%. Like, wow, that's incredible. Historically, it was crazy good. Well, four and a half, almost five years, you know, about four and a half years later, interest rates have fallen to the floor. So my prepayment penalty to get out of that loan early was two point, almost $2.4 million. So while it can be a very, very good benefit to buying, it can also really hurt you on a sale if you don't have somebody willing to assume your loan. So that's the biggest impact I'm seeing there. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, you know, with if you're having to hold these properties for longer, I mean, surely that's going to impact your return. How are you planning on, you know, making that up, right? Because, it, you know, if you bought a, an apartment complex two, three years ago, 
with an anticipated return for the investors over five years, and now you're having to look at seven or 10. I mean, how are you underwriting projects differently now? Well, that's it. It's on all the new assets. Any of the existing assets, we're in a great position to sell. Again, as long as you can navigate that prepayment penalty, it doesn't kind of crush your return. So selling something that I bought two, three, four, five years ago, really not a whole lot of impact, but it's on the buy side again that, you know, I'm just having to carry it out further because it takes longer to generate as much profit as I did prior uh, because I am paying up so high. You know, people talk about, well, with uh, interest rates and cap rates going the way they have, they will continue to go down for a while is what a lot of experts are guessing. And that's fine. But as you go lower, those prices go higher, your cap rates drop. It just takes longer to make a stabilized property really worth it, in my opinion. Um, you know, because not only are you holding it longer, the longer you hold an asset, the more likely you are to have to put in major cap X into the project again. So when you buy something and you plan to hold it for five years, you might come up with a million dollar budget for rehab on a two, 300 unit property. Well, that's usually going to last you four to six years on average. And if now I have to underwrite and my business model changes from a five-year hold to a 10-year hold, there's a very high likelihood that those things that I fixed on the front end either are going to start to wear out again or new things are going to pop up that weren't needing to be addressed when I first purchased. So you've got a couple of legs there that you really have to kind of work through. Um, and yes, you can do cash out refis, you can do supplemental loans, things like that to get a few more loan dollars to address some of those issues in your four, five and six. But that's not always a doable thing when you're dealing with uh, when, when you're dealing with these loans, because if you're buying a full cash flowing property, basically a fully stabilized asset, there's probably not a lot of value creation you can drive out of it. And if that's the case, well, if your value doesn't go up much there's really not a lot of chance to do a cash out refi. So again, you know, I beat this to death all the time on every episode, but this is why you really need a coach that's been through some cycles, that has been through some headaches and, you know, got the experience that you lack. Because there's a lot of this stuff that you just don't understand going in because it's probably not covered in depth in a lot of books or in a lot of classes you take. Yeah, I mean, that makes a lot of sense. I think you know, if you're if you're looking at a property on a four to five year hold and all of a sudden it shifts to seven to ten, I mean, you start thinking about all of the, you know, HVAC units that are you know probably nearing the end of their life that, you know, you replaced a bunch on the front end. But there were some that were, you know, newer that now on a seven to ten year hold, you're you're probably going to have to replace those. So, I mean, it makes sense. What uh, what about on the tenant side? I mean, you know, a lot of people lost their jobs. How have you seen that impacting rent collection and, and lease up? So the lower down market you go, the lower the socioeconomic profile of your property, the more problem you're having. Because the lower you go, the more service industry jobs you're encountering with your tenants. You know, they're working in the restaurant industry, the bar industry, the hotel industry. Well, if you think about it, those are the industries for the most part that got crushed. They've been affected the most. So our, the higher we go, the less impact there is. So we have a lot of B plus assets and those are very faring very well uh our c properties and we do have a c minus property it's still a good property super profitable luckily it was super profitable because it's the one that's been affected the most you know our collections have gone down um our um our well, occupancy has gone up and i mean uh, gone down good lord so the occupancy has gone <laughs> down the collections have gotten worse so we're not collecting as much as we're billing out like we were because before if I build up $200,000, $250,000 to this one property, I would collect about 99.5% of that. I mean, we, we're really, really good at collecting monies due us. Well, with COVID, we're down in the, you know, the low 90s now. And that's still not devastating. It's not going to you know, ruin our project. It's not going to cause us to lose the property at all. We're still solidly profitable, just not like we were. So as we start to come out of the, honestly, but... As that starts to work its way through the system, we will see that stuff start to rebound as the restaurants and bars get to open back up. Uh, a lot of them work, um, you know, maid services, things like that, too. So th they're very, very uh, at risk. And uh, but again, the B, B plus A properties, we don't own any A's, but I imagine they're faring 
fairly well themselves. Because again, the higher up market you go, like an A property, an A plus property, these are usually white collar people. And a lot of them are in the tech industry and they have the ability to work remotely. It's not a customer facing industry. So they're spared a lot. Has it impacted, you know, which markets you're looking in? I mean, obviously, Austin, you know, it's one of the 18 hour cities. It's, it's, you know, expanding rapidly. Um, obviously, you know, you've got a lot of these tech companies moving out of California to Austin, uh, very similar to Nashville. You know, has that given you more confidence in the Austin market? Has that made you, you know, start thinking, oh, maybe we should look at, you know, other potential markets? I mean, how are you kind of, how, how are you viewing that now? Well, no, I still like the Austin market. Um, I don't look all over the country like a lot of people that listen to this podcast. A lot of the guys that I know that do what I do, they chase uh, projects all over the country, all 50 states. I don't do that, right? There's nothing wrong with what they're doing. They'll find more deals than I will, but I'm not really interested in that approach. So it, I don't have to really start looking earnestly for other markets. You know, we're in Nashville now, uh, Austin, San Antonio, Central Texas is where we are. And I don't see a whole lot of negative impact. Now you go into some of the other states in the nation, you've got really, really aggressive uh, government regulations that are tripping people up. Um, you know, some, and, and I don't know all the regulations, so don't skewer me if I've got a few of these wrong, but you know, what I'm hearing is uh, California, you hear a lot about Oregon, uh, New York, some of the higher priced cities and states cities and states with uh, uh, with state income tax. So there are certain states that I didn't want to be in anyways, but now I definitely want no part of being in them. I was talking to uh, one of my mortgage broker friends the other day, and he was telling me how rough it's getting in California. I told him about the project that we have here that we just talked about that, you know, it, it's been impacted. He said, Bruce, okay, so that property has been impacted and that, that's a big deal compared to where you usually are with that one specific property. You have no idea. In, um, in California, it's, it's bad. There's a lot of collection risk right now. There's a lot of non-collected rent. Nobody can evict anybody. And again, like I always say, I don't want to evict anybody, but I have to make sure I don't lose the property. So when you get told you can't evict anybody and... I think Austin just announced that they're going to extend the moratorium on evictions through uh, February. I think California either is talking about it or they already have extended it through all of 2021. I understand why they're doing it. it makes sense because you don't want a lot of homeless people now that are going to spread coronavirus even more rapidly. But at the same time, if you do not finally provide some kind of relief to the landlords, Lots of people are going to start losing a lot of properties and the properties are going to start falling apart and that's going to negatively impact the people that could pay rent. Yeah. I mean, that's, uh, you know, it's such a catch 22, right? I mean, you know, landlords are, you know, working for a living too. It's not like you could just start not collecting rent and you're going to be fine. I mean, banks are still expecting the mortgage to be paid every month. And so, you know, it's, it's just been interesting to see, you know, landlords aren't getting help just like people aren't getting help. I mean, the government's having, you know, all these issues passing, you know, stimulus bills to, you know, pay people. They can't help people. They can't help landlords. Um, but, you know, investor confidence in the market is incredibly strong. I mean, you know, you're starting to see cap rates still getting compressed in certain product types, which is pretty remarkable to me, don't you think? Oh, yeah. I was talking to uh, my, not my mortgage broker, but my actual real estate broker, one of one of the ones that I use um, the other day, because I just sold a property. We were recapping after we closed on Thursday. And I said, you know, I'll be back in the market earnestly in Central Texas for, uh, in Q1. So, you know, keep me in mind. But we just started talking through that. Uh, I said, so, you know, in the market for Central Texas, we're probably looking for a steep property like in the five or a little bit below five cap rate. He goes, hell no. I'm like, what do you mean hell no? He said, dude, look, if you're buying in San Antonio right now, if you're buying a C asset in San Antonio, especially a B, you're going to pay a four to a four and a quarter cap. I'm like, oh, my God. He said, in Austin, you're paying a 3.75 to a four and a quarter cap. That's incredible. That is absolutely incredible. You know, when I bought um, one of my properties, the last property I bought in Austin, I paid a six cap roughly about three years ago, I believe, yeah, about three, three and a half years ago, actually. 
Well, now I could probably sell that thing for a low four or an upper three cap rate. Again, that makes a massive difference in my value. But if I go sell that property, all my properties are, have Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac loans. So we go back to that conversation again that I have a hellacious prepay, prepayment penalty on that property. That's a lot of P's and it's hard to say. <laughs> um, but if I sell that now, I've got a $4 million prepayment penalty on that asset, right? So wow. while I bought it for $18.7 million, there's a chance I could get $32 to $35 million for that same property, which just seems ridiculous, almost asinine. But that's what the cap rate environment has done. Um, so even with a $4 million prepayment penalty, some of the assets that I'm sitting on, it might still be worth selling those, even if I can't sell them on an assumption. Because when you sell on an assumption, you don't have to deal with that prepayment penalty because you're not paying off the loan, right? You're just rolling the loan into somebody else's, uh, onto somebody else's books. So uh, yeah, cap rates are just nuts low right now. Yeah, I mean, you know, lenders certainly appreciate uh, probably a loan assumption right now. I would, I would imagine, uh, considering the the interest rates they'll have. But and it makes sense too, though, right? I mean, you look at the stock market, and some assets have performed really well, some have performed very poorly. But I mean, it's just been this up and down and up and down roller coaster. I mean, you know, March, April was almost miserable for a lot of people to to just watch because it was so crazy i mean every day it was you know you're skyrocketing on tesla the next day you're you're bottoming out on tesla i mean that you know that's obviously been one of the better performing stocks but commercial real estate has actually maintained uh and gone pretty steady i mean it's really retained its value well and it showed how um you know these you know crazy market swings actually don't really have an impact on that asset class Right. And one thing that I just want to make sure everybody understands when we talk, you know, we throw a lot of terms around and, you know, talk lingo and jargon. Remember, commercial, that's everything we're talking about. Uh, commercial includes multifamily. Now, it is residential, but it's still treated as commercial because you're buying it as a business. Right. So just keep that clear. Um, but yeah, I mean, they have weathered the storm pretty well. And, you know, even when you have a property, what I've noticed over the last, you know, roughly 10 years that even when you have a deal that doesn't go as well as you planned it to go, because that's going to happen on deals, you know, real estate, even with all this crazy crap that's going on now, if you're a good operator and you bought it at a reasonable price with a margin of safety, you're pretty much going to make it through most, if not all, uh, market downturns. So I don't want to say necessarily that it's very forgiving, but I mean, it, I guess it really is. It especially when you're getting into residential commercial, people have to have a place to live. Now, if it gets bad enough, they will, that place to live will be under a bridge, but it takes a lot for us to get just destroyed in multifamily because again, that is about other than, you know, putting food in your mouth. That's about the last thing people are going to cut. So we, we have been not unscathed, but we've weathered it very, very well throughout commercial. That's true. I mean, it's, uh, you know, multifamily is, is, is almost the safer asset class within commercial real estate, right? I mean, you could, you have that, the safety of people living there. Um, but you know, as you and I've been talking about, it's interesting, the, the value that you can really add in commercial real estate, especially when we're doing, um, you know, these, these value add vacant, you know, almost completely vacant buildings. Right. And, uh, you know, multifamily is the safest, really in the commercial niche, but it comes with a lower return because of that, right? So, you know, I don't want people to think, oh, I need to stay in multifamily because it's the only thing that's safe. First of all, there's nothing 100% safe. Secondly, it's not the only thing that's safe within commercial real estate. It's the risk reward paradigm thing, right? So the riskier an investment is implied, the higher your return needs to be, right? So that keeps a cap on prices. As you go safer, like in multifamily, your prices will be higher, relatively speaking, because the expectation for return is a lot more reasonable because there's less risk in people's minds of losing money. So you can still be pretty safe in like more traditional commercial, like retail, um, office, industrial, warehouse, that kind of thing, but they will come with higher returns. That makes sense. So what are you seeing right now in terms of, you know, what kind of returns ex, uh, investors can expect? I mean, are you seeing, have you seen that shift significantly since the beginning of the year? 
Well, it has come down, definitely. When I first got involved, it was normal to have 10 to 12, maybe even 15% cash and cash returns. And now we're seeing 5 to 7% returns by the end of the first year. So it's definitely changed. It's still better than most any other thing you can put your money in right now. So when you're investing, you're looking at alternatives. You can put it in the stock market, yes, and you may get more a 5% return. Historically, you will. But it comes with a lot more uh, variation, a lot more volatility. And a lot of people just don't want to deal with that volatility. You know, you can have something happen like happened in 2008. You know, you could lose half of your portfolio. Unless you're just a really bad operator, which is your fault, not the industry's fault. Unless you're a really bad operator, that's not going to happen to you in multifamily or commercial for that matter either. So it's just, you know, you, you just got to think about it realistically and logically. Yes, multifamily might only be provided a five, six or seven percent return by the end of the first year. But it's still better than the other places I can put it, especially when you take risk into consideration. Well, Bruce, I'm killing it with Bitcoin. Your risk is up through the roof. Your volatility is nuts, right? So I still like commercial real estate as my number one investment vehicle. And within that, I still prefer, um, you know, I'm going to say I don't like being residential. But what I mean by that, I don't like single family homes, right? They're gr Okay, here we go again. I like them, but it, they just don't, they pale in comparison to commercial real estate. I still prefer to put the majority of my net worth in investing dollars in commercial real estate because you have much higher upside. It's more rational. Again, when you compare it to Bitcoin, when you compare it to the stock market, you know, it's so much more rational and you don't have the knee jerk ups and downs. Yeah, and not to mention all the other benefits that we've we've discussed about investing in, in commercial real estate before. And you know, the, the what I love about the entire asset class of of the commercial multifamily real estate is that you can diversify your portfolio into multiple different asset types. You want something a little more stable that's going to give you 5 to 7% cash, you you get some some multifamily. You want to take a, you know, a stab at getting a 20% IRR, you can invest in a in a commercial development. Um, you know, there's, there's so many different ways, uh, for you to invest and get different kinds of returns. Right. And you mentioned this a little bit, but not only is it more rational than the stock market and Bitcoin and some of the more speculative investments, maybe oil, things like that, but also there are other benefits outside of the return structure. You know, you have such an incredible benefit from a tax standpoint and commercial real estate is incredible. You know, most projects won't pay taxes on their earnings on a year to year basis. Now, the more profitable you get with that project, the more likely you are to finally have to start paying some taxes. But because of the use of depreciation and cost segregation, which we're not going to go into it right now because it's a pretty deep conversation. But because of that stuff, you know, you might get, you know, the property might, you know, kick out one hundred thousand, two hundred thousand dollars in free cash flow that you can distribute to your investors. But your investors not, are not paying taxes on that. Because legitimately, your property is being run at a loss, even though you are able to pull cash out of it because of the depreciation expense or the depreciation loss, if you want to look at it that way. So it's totally legal to do, totally legit. It's gap uh, approved, basically. So there's nothing wrong with it. It's what you're supposed to be doing here. And that's why we don't pay taxes a lot on real estate investments. Yeah, I mean, there's there's so many benefits there. What do you think that, uh, you know, what do you think is going to happen for multifamily in 2021? For everybody I talk to and listen to, it, it sounds like we're going to be kind of where we are. Cap rates may still continue to compress, which, again, it's great when you're selling. If you don't have to worry about the prepayment penalty, it makes it harder and harder to buy. But they keep going down because people still keep pouring money in. To the uh, end of the industry. So that's what makes the cap rates continue to go down, returns continue to go down because people are willing to take a lower return than they were yesterday, maybe for the same type of cash flow because they deem it as the safest of the uh, investments they can make. I don't see that changing for a little while. And again, most of the smart people that I talk to or listen to, they're all saying kind of the same thing. Um, I think cap rates will continue to go down, which will drive prices even higher. Um, talking to that, more, that uh, real estate broker the other day, we're talking about it that, look, 
He said, Bruce, get into spring, keep your NOI where it is, you know, of course, increase it if you can, but where cap rates are now, there's a very good chance they're going to be even lower in the spring. Now, nobody knows for sure what will the Fed do, what will Congress do, nobody knows, but it looks like cap rates are going to keep going down, values will keep going up, your price to entry so even if you can lock in a uh, five to seven percent return, you're having to pay a lot more dollars to get those returns now. So your cost of entry does get a lot higher. When I brought, bought my first property, I was buying at an eight cap. I was paying thirty-four thousand dollars a door. Now we're paying four wow. caps in uh, that same neighborhood. Now that was a uh, a property with studios, and that's all it was like three four hundred unit, uh, three or four hundred square feet. But down the street, I own in the same submarket, and my average is about 1,100 square feet now, 1,000 to 1,100 square feet. So there's a difference there, but still, I could probably sell that for 150 to $170,000 a door right now. So your cost of entry goes up. It does make it harder for new people to get involved in some of these super, super hot markets. But that's why a lot of people team up. That's why a lot of people get into syndication, so they don't have to do it all out of their, uh, their own back pocket. Look like we had a question. Uh, no, we didn't have a question. I was just letting everybody know if they have any questions, you are more than welcome to let us know in the chat and we will get to those, um, as we're going here. I, um, you know, it's, it's interesting to see, you know, obviously PwC and the urban land Institute recently released their, uh, predictions for commercial real estate in 2021 and emerging trends and all of that kind of stuff. And so, you know, we wrote an article and, and I, I dove into that and, um, have plenty of commercial stuff to talk about, but, what do you think are, are some emerging trends in the multifamily world? I mean, how do you think COVID, like what will be the long lasting impact of COVID on multifamily? Long lasting impact. You know, the, the biggest thing that comes to mind is AI. You know, you're going to have artificial intelligence and it's already in the market to a degree now, but it keeps getting developed more and more. You're going to get to a point where well, there's a chance anyways, that you're not going to have a lot of face-to-face -face interaction with tenants or prospects. Things are going to be done remotely. Things are going to be done virtually. Now, I, I don't know how you're going to be able to do that when, when it comes to uh, the maintenance of the property. So you have a 300 unit property. You probably have three full time maintenance people running around the property, keeping it in good repair. I don't know how that will be changed, you know, but I, I think your face to face with the leasing professional, the assistant managers, the property managers, I think that's going to change dramatically. And while it's sad on some level that people will be out of jobs if that happens. And I think it will. It's also going to make investments more profitable because now I might pay a lot for AI, but it will probably still be less again, 300 unit property example. It'll probably still be less than having to pay three full-time people to man that office. So, you know, I look forward to it. You know, I'm not nervous in any way, but I do have a concern for the people that may be out of a job. And that's where we get into the whole Darwinism thing, right? And people talk about that a lot right now with COVID and everybody losing jobs. And remember Darwinism, the most adaptable will survive. So guys, if you find yourself in that boat, you work in the industry, in the office, I'm not saying it's going to happen. I'm saying there's a high likelihood it could happen. You better be prepared now. Start setting yourself up to be able to cope with a new environment. You go to work for a company that develops AI. I don't know. I don't know what the answer is for you specifically, but you can't put your head in the sand and think, oh, well, this is what I know. This has always worked and that'll never happen to me. Okay. Well, that that's going to happen. What's happened in the coal industry? Um, you know, that's the first one that pops it in mind. And people, you know, complain about Amazon. Progress is going to happen no matter what. You have to be ready to adapt and pivot if it comes to you and eventually it's going to come to everybody at some point in whatever industry you're in industries get uprooted upended that you know netflix destroyed blockbuster blockbuster did not adapt they refused to adapt reed hastings tried to get blockbuster in the early days to buy it for a very reasonable amount i think it was maybe 50 to 100 million dollars they kind of laughed him out of the building i don't it might not even have been kind of it they may have actually laughed them out of the building blockbusters gone so please i'm sorry i'm on a tangent here but please guys be adaptable be nimble be willing to pivot and see this shit that's coming the best you can and say oh 
this might happen. If it doesn't, great. If it does, I need to be ready. Yeah, I mean, the, the metaphor that I use all the time is, you know, mail used to get delivered by horse. I'm sure that there were a lot of a lot of riders that were upset when mail started getting delivered by car and by plane. And, you know, I mean, you think about how, how much more efficient that is for everybody, right? Like, I don't really want my mail delivered by horse. I'm actually pretty grateful that it gets delivered by plane now, <laughs> you know? Exactly. Um, Progress think, is good. You just have to be ready to roll with it as it comes. Well, exactly. And I mean, think about how many jobs have been created in the last 10 years that would have that nobody could have ever thought would be a thing, right? Like we're building, you know, commercially available drones for normal people. Like that's, that's kind of crazy, right? Like that's actually really futuristic. And so now there's tons of factory jobs and all that kind of stuff of building drones. But how yeah, do you think that, vehicles, I mean, how is that going to impact the, the taxi and the Uber industry? and trucking companies and you know truck drivers might be out of job yeah i mean it's never going to stop it's just going to keep going so keep your head up and watching around you all the time all right i'm done with that sorry <laughs> no worries how do you think it'll impact the amenities that that multifamily investors are, are providing to their tenants like what, what do you how do you see that changing well, I don't know that I see it changing a whole lot. Now, there are different amenities being imagined all the time. People, you know, something that we talked about on the last one, because we were talking about our, our commercial deal that we're developing, that food hall mixed use concept. I think a lot of uh, multifamily builders, especially, are going to start building with this new uh, kind of like Gen Z person in mind, because like we talked before, a lot of people are starting podcasts now. A lot of people are doing meetups. You might see more of that kind of stuff coming into multifamily, actually. I think you're going to start seeing maybe some, some soundproof rooms that people can go in and record. If not, I think it might be a miss that that would really differentiate you in the market. So I don't personally see where a lot's going to change because we'll get past the pandemic. But what, once you're past it, we can open our amenities back up because a lot of amenities have been shut down. They opened up a little bit in the in the summer, but I think with the new spike in coronavirus cases, a lot of people have rolled back and shut down their gyms and they've shut down maybe a, a business center. So I don't know how you're going to really alter that much, but what I think is going to happen is you're going to see different types of amenities coming online. Yeah, I think that's I think that's for sure. Right. I mean, it's you know, you've got a lot of these. Uh, I mean, everybody's talking about how to socially distance within office. Right. But you're, you're also living, you know, with 200 plus other people in an apartment complex. So how do you how do you socially distance now with the amenities and amenity centers that you have? It will uh, it'll be interesting to see, you know, how that uh, how that continues to evolve. Yep. Um, <laughs> so on the on the commercial front, I mean, there are some really interesting trends that are that are you know, moving to the forefront of investors' minds, um, you know, the four that I think are going to have the biggest impact on 2021 are ghost kitchens, micro units, uh, last mile distribution, and wow, of course, I'm going to blank on the fourth one. Um, but okay, well, we'll run with three for now. So ghost kitchens, <laughs> micro units, last mile distribution. I'll, oh, prop tech, obviously prop tech. I mean, you kind of, you mentioned AI, I mean, prop tech is massive right now, um, but let's dive into ghost kitchens. I mean, you know, obviously that's a, um, if you don't know what a ghost kitchen is, it is essentially a, a kitchen um, for the, like, you know, take the kitchen out of a restaurant, remove all of the seating. So you don't go in there and you eat. It, they are actually designed for um, basically to go and delivery. I mean, they're optimized for, for Uber Eats and, and Postmates. And, you know, they started in California. We've talked about these a little bit um, when we were talking about the project last week. But, you know, that's a massive emerging trend. I see that becoming the next food truck craze. You know, I mean, it, that, that helped revolutionize the restaurant industry. Um, you know, what, uh, what do you see coming from that? Well, I, I think it's exactly the same thing. And we talked about it with micro units last week that, yeah, I think it lowers the cost of entry, the barrier to entry. You know, it's not as risky to start a restaurant for those people now because, you know, it wasn't really profitable for people to have uh, Uber Eats and Postmates and all those other companies, you know, accounting for I, I'm going to make up a number here because I don't know what the number is, but accounting for 10 to 20 percent of their business when that's going on. 
they're having to pay a huge toll basically to these delivery companies because delivery companies have to make money or it makes no sense for them to do it, but that's coming out of the restaurateur's back pocket. So if I can lower my, my cost of startup and uh, you know operating expenses by having a much smaller space, because now I don't have to have a dining room, right? The dining room, I'm guessing is 60% of the build out space, if not maybe 70. So now you, you can shrink what you have for floor space and again, we talked about this. I think a lot of ghost kitchens are being designed with multiple concepts cooking out of the same general area. They might, you know, have four distinct setups within this one ghost kitchen so they can, you know, basically host four different restaurateurs. So I think that's that's going to be huge because people still want to open restaurants. People still want to get food from restaurants. So again, they're just, here we go. They are adapting to what's going on. The people that don't adapt, that they're gonna go out of business. They just are, you know? It, to support a 10 to 20,000 square foot restaurant, you gotta be killing it. You gotta be the hot spot in town or one of the hot spots in town with a waiting list every single night. You can't get a reservation if, unless you call two weeks out. Those people, of course, will be fine. But trying to start a new concept or, you know, a concept that was getting by, but not, too comfortably and then you get slapped with coronavirus those people if they don't adapt they're going to be in a lot of trouble yeah i think that's absolutely right i mean you think about if you're going to open you know most of these most restaurants are you know 2000 2500 3000 square feet i mean that is that's a lot of square footage and especially going into coronavirus you know these restaurants you know in nashville it's not uncommon for you to be paying 25 30 you know 35 dollars plus per square foot net so you, I mean, you run that number, thirty dollars a foot net on three thousand square feet. That's ninety grand a year just in base rent that you have to pay. So if you get closed down, I mean, you're almost paying ten thousand. You're probably paying over ten thousand dollars a month once you take into account, you know, common area maintenance, property taxes, building insurance, and utilities. Not to mention the fact that you've got staff. I mean, there's and, and food, and you know that's expensive to run. I mean, the amazing thing about ghost kitchens is that, you know, they're smaller spaces, which means even if you're paying a higher dollar per square foot in rent, which is what's great for the landlords on, on these kinds of concepts, overall monthly, you're paying far less. It gives these chefs an opportunity to basically come in and test out a concept. I mean, we're talking with a lot of chefs that, you know, we're working at restaurants that they got closed down during COVID. And they're, they finally have some downtime to kind of, you know, explore these concepts that they've always wanted to do. So, uh, you know, it's it's fascinating to, to have those conversations. It's it's you know we're going to start seeing a lot of, of concepts pop up that never would have existed otherwise, um, which I think is really fascinating. But you know, they these ghost kitchens offer flexible lease terms. It's kind of that next step from you know working out of your kitchen at home to uh, you know actually getting your own space, and you get to test out a concept without having to dive you know head in or head first rather, and spend six or seven figures, commit to a five or 10 year lease and, you know, have to hire this massive staff just to see and hope that this concept will work, right? Right. So let's dig into those numbers a little bit more. So let's say you said it was $30 a square foot net, right? Times, let's say average, let's just call it 2,500. That's $75,000 a year. So that's 6250 a month. Right. So let's say they go to a ghost kitchen instead. and that's just base rent to be to, exactly. be to be very clear. That's just base rent. That doesn't include your triple net fees, utilities, anything like that. Right. So that's sixty two hundred dollars. Call it six thousand to make it easy to follow along with. Right. So now let's say you get into a ghost kitchen type space that maybe a six hundred square feet. Right. And it, let's say you're paying fifty dollars a square foot in rent instead of thirty. That's still thirty thousand dollars a year or twenty five hundred dollars a month. So because they don't have to deal with the front of the house, right? There's no dining area anymore. You know, they're paying, uh, what, $3,500 less a month. So again, it gives a lot more flexibility in something you mentioned too, as investors, which most people on this uh, on this uh, broadcast would be interested in is investing, not starting a restaurant necessarily. You know, if I can get $50 per square foot instead of 30, oh my God, I'm a lot more profitable. But one other thing I want to talk about is you, because I get some pushback or some questions and confusion from uh, multifamily investors. They'll say, okay, you're saying $30 a square foot? 
if I'm at a thousand square foot space, you know, so do the math, a thousand square foot space times 30, that's $30,000 a month in rent? No, right? In multifamily, rental rates are factored on a monthly basis. In commercial, you know, true commercial, more traditional commercial, they're factored on an annual basis. So that $30 per square foot is a yearly total. Then you divide that over 12. But when we start saying $30 per square foot for a thousand square feet, the multifamily guys are hearing that going, wait, that makes no sense. I'm lost. I don't get it. So I just want to take a couple of seconds and explain that. Yeah, I think that's, that's good too. I mean, also, you know, it depends on what part of the country you're in, you know, commercial real estate in California, they do the exact same as multifamily. It's all on a dollar per square foot per month basis. Um, so yeah, good, good, good to clarify, but yeah, I mean, you know, the, the great thing about ghost kitchens is that you can actually take this, you know, what was also unusable space, or maybe it was just a warehouse space. Um, like we've got, uh, a couple of different properties that we're looking at potentially doing these ghost kitchens in, and I actually know one that, that they did, um, actually in East Nashville, uh, at Hunter station. So if you go to Hunter station in East Nashville, which is a, a little indoor food hall from a local group here. Um, there is actually a basement that has a, that has a, a kitchen in it, a ghost kitchen. And all of those are, you know, they're kind of testing out concepts and starting them off on, you know, Uber eats and to go and delivery and whatnot. But they basically took what would have been, you know, unusable space, right? Because, you know, retail can't go in there. It's a basement. So no one's going to rent it for office space. You'd have to spend a lot of money, you know, to retrofit it for that. But, you know, they turn it into ghost kitchens. You don't necessarily need windows to go in there and, and cook for a few hours. And you can always just step outside and, you know, get some light. I mean, kitchens don't have windows anyway. So it's it's pretty interesting, the, the different types of spaces that you can now actually utilize for this. Yeah, it's uh, I, I'm probably going to use the wrong term here because, you know, you're the commercial guy, but it's adaptive reuse, right? You know, what was it used for before? Right. What it was used for before doesn't necessarily mean that's what's got to be used for uh, in the future, remember again, adaptability, right? It didn't, it used to work for this 10 years ago, but now the next 10 years, that space might not be used for the same thing. So you've always got to have your mind open and be a little creative in your thinking that, you know, I'm going to buy this space and it's been used for X. Well, when I buy it, I'm going to use it for Y instead because there's more use, more demand, and more flexibility. So again, everything I'm talking about today seems to be coming back to adaptability. You have to be able to think outside of your box. That's so true. I mean, you asked me the other day about, uh, you know, a bowling alley uh, that's that's in your neighborhood. I mean, that might actually be a great use for that bowling alley, right? Turn it into a ghost kitchen. And you could even turn it into a little food court and have, you know, a little retail area where people can come in, you know, more of a food hall than a food court. Uh, you could have your, you know, the private kitchens in the back where there's no windows at the back of the bowling alley. And then have the front more retail facing with some seating. I mean, that could make a really great adaptive reuse into a food hall. So, yeah, look at what's going on with traditional malls. They're all having to do that now because traditional malls are dying. Right. Uh, you know, some of the bowlers that are listening are probably going to hate me for this, but I think bowling, my gut feeling, I have no idea, but my gut feeling is bowling is dying, right? There's a reason that bowling alley in my neighborhood is gone, right? So there's all kinds of other things you can do with that. You don't have to go, oh, wow, that's a great building, but it's a bowling alley. I don't want to buy a bowling alley. Well, what else can you do with it? It'd be expensive to repurpose it probably to rip all that crap out of there. But man, you're going to get a great price because nobody wants to put a bowling alley in there anymore. Yep. And that's 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 how a lot of investors are having to look at, you know, big box retail. You know, what else could this possibly be? You know, I mean, you've got these 10,000 square foot boxes so, you know, adaptive reuse, I mean, that, that should probably be on the tri on the list of trends for 2021. But, you know, keep an eye out for, for properties that are, you know, completely underutilized. I mean, you look at a 10,000 square foot, you know, former big box retailer. I mean, that would make a great church, a great gym. You could turn it into an indoor food hall. Um, you could even make it a distribution facility. You know, I mean, for, for Nashville, that's, you know, kind of a big deal because Nashville has, you know, we've got Amazon moving here. And it's a, it's a big logistics hub. And, you know, if you're going to, you know, industrial space is really tough to come by. And guess what? Those retail spaces are not very far off from industrial big, you know, industrial um, buildings. So they, they make an easy adaptive reuse there. So 
that's uh i mean that's it for ghost kitchens micro units micro units are have been trending for i mean i would say probably since 2008 but in the last you know year or two years they've really started picking up steam so you know and micro units aren't just in multifamily they're also appearing in commercial too but bruce i mean what are you saying as far as micro units go in multifamily how's i mean what does that look like how big are they um and how how what's what's the impact um or potential impact that micro units could have on multifamily investing. Okay, so I want to co- kind of cover it from two different directions and have a totally different answer in each direction, right? So micro units, when you're talking about an affordability issue in specific cities, like maybe, you know, New York and San Francisco, maybe LA, um, you know, it can help because now you have a smaller space that, yeah, you might be paying more per square foot as a resident, but it's a much smaller space, so it's easier to afford. Think um, single professionals, think college students that don't want to live in a dorm environment. So there is, I think, more demand as affordability gets worse. But then on the flip side, we talked about COVID at the beginning of this. And with COVID, I think you're going to see exactly the opposite. For people that have the wherewithal and the means, they make good money at their job. If they can afford to get a bigger space, they're probably going to get a bigger space. Because everybody realized, oh, my God, I got locked down for six months, potentially, in some parts of the country. And, you know, think about the people in tiny homes, that big movement. Well, how are you liking your tiny home now when you can't really get out? Now, I guess a lot of those people are outdoor people. They're hiking, so it's not like they're, you know, they're indoors all the time anyways. But when you're locked in your house... And let's say your apartment is five or 600 square feet and there's two of you in there or a family of of three, maybe, you know, that gets really tough, really cramped. So I think you're going to see larger spaces being rented because you want a place that you can put in an office, maybe a gym. So instead of a one bedroom, maybe you need a two bedroom in your mind. Also, you're going to start seeing people and you're already seeing it. People are moving out to the suburbs. You know, there was this big move where everything was coming back into the cities. But with coronavirus in a densely populated, uh, congested downtown area, you know, people might not feel comfortable in that situation anymore. So people are looking to get further out. You have more space. People that, that can afford a home and want to buy a home. Well, maybe you can get some more land further out for the same price. Um, somebody that rents an apartment, maybe instead of having that four or 500 square foot space downtown, Maybe you go out into the suburbs and you get that two bedroom apartment for roughly the same price. So I think that's what's going to be going on. Uh, it, again, it already is now some, but I, so I think there's going to be two things at play, uh, coronavirus and then affordability. So it'll be interesting to see how that absolutely falls out, but I think things are going to change. Interesting. So you don't think that micro units will be as big of a trend in multifamily as they, they will be in other asset classes? Well, it depends. Again, if if they really want to or need to live in an area because of their job potentially, then yeah, I think micro units will be a very big deal. I think that that has a lot of uh, merit. It makes a lot of sense. But again, if you've got people that are worried about COVID and you you know they're looking forward to say we will get another pandemic in our lifetime, I don't know, but there will be another one that comes. And if you start thinking about that, let's say it happens again in five years, in two years, in 10 years, whatever. Do I really want to be cramped up in this 400 square foot apartment? Probably not. You go crazy. So I think that, yeah, micro units and some situations are going to be a big deal. But with, you know, respect to coronavirus and things like this, people that have this on their mind, then it's probably not going to be right for them. But I think there will be enough demand from an affordability standpoint that enough people will need to live downtown or at least feel they need to live downtown. So there will still be a demand for it. It just depends on where in the cities you're looking. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's that's really interesting because, you know, the affordability component of it is probably going to be the biggest reason that micro units start to trend because, you know, you look at, at markets like Nashville and Austin, and, you know, Raleigh, Durham, Denver, I mean, rent has gotten so expensive. You know, I mean, I remember when you were, you know, I guess eight years ago in Nashville, I mean, you could rent an apartment by yourself for eight, 900 bucks a month. Um, and now it's, you know, 13 to $1,500 a month. And that, I mean, that's a significant increase for your average person. So you think about the impact that that'll have, um, you know, 
there's a there's an affordable housing crisis. I mean, Nashville alone, I think, is supposed to have a, a deficit of 30,000 units by 2025, which means that there are there will be a need for 30,000 affordable units. And, uh, you know, micro units are an interesting way uh, to provide affordable housing at market rates and not have to go through light tech and deal deal with all of the you know affordable housing components so that uh it'll be interesting to see the fallout i i totally see where you're coming from though i mean you know, with COVID, if you're locked up uh at, at home you know i mean basically 18 hours 24 hours a day you're gonna want a place to you know get away from yourself almost or get away from your family or get away you know Right. I think, too, what will end up happening, it's like everything. We forget everything. We forget history. So once we get past this fully and say we're past it by three to five years, I firmly believe human nature is everyone's going to forget about coronavirus and all the crap they had to go through. And they will start going to micro units because the affordability piece is not going to be a forgettable thing because it's going to be an everyday, all day thing and you can't escape it. Coronavirus will be in the rearview mirror, and a lot of people will let down their guard and go, oh, it's gone, out of sight, out of mind, so to speak. So they just completely forget about it. And But again, the affordability piece will never, ever not be an issue for people that it's an issue for. So I think, yes, it, it, as we put more and more distance between us and coronavirus, I think they're going to start going back the other way and wanting bigger spaces, um, I mean, smaller spaces downtown. Yep. Yep. I think you're, I think you're right. I think people, I mean, we've already seen it. People have kind of forgotten that coronavirus is existing now and they're just going out and doing things and not wearing a mask and all that kind of stuff. So as soon as that it is actually cleared, I would imagine people will forget about it very fast and it will just be, you know, some small dot in the rearview mirror. Uh, you know, micro units in commercial space are, t are, are really hot right now. Um, we had one project, uh, it, it was a, an office building that I actually bought back in 2019 um, over in South Nashville and we converted this massive, you know, it was a single 6,000 square foot office space into, I want to say it was 12 micro office units. So pretty much right around 200 to 400 square feet. We had a couple that were a little bit bigger than that, but we signed six leases since March on that and ended up getting it filled up. I sold the investors on a, on a 36 month timeline and we ended up finishing it and sold it in 16 months because it was just that, you know, right place, right time. Right. So it's, uh, it's interesting to see the leasing velocity for those smaller spaces. You know, those entrepreneurs are still out there. They still want to get their own space, but we work may not be an option for them anymore or, you know, co-working spaces because you kind of want a private space. Now you don't really want to be out in the open or surrounded by all these other people. And right. But those places are expensive as hell too. Now, for what you get, it's probably a good value. But when people are trying to cut, you know, value, it's not always about value. It's about actual dollars. How many dollars am I having to spend? And, you know, with WeWork, you have a lot of times you have fully stocked kitchens. You have speakers that will come in. You have a community that you're buying into. But they might not be able to afford that anymore. You go into a Regis situation, they'll provide you with a, a receptionist. They'll re provide you with your desks, I believe. Well, a lot of people, they're just not going to be able to afford that anymore, maybe. And like you said, they want to, they still want to go into an office. They're tired of working in their home office, but they want a smaller space, you know, just enough to do the work they need to do and not have a lot of the frills. So I think some of the frills might start going by the wayside for a little while, at least again. Well, it, it, it comes down to affordability is really what it is. Yeah, I mean, we've seen, you know, we're working on a couple of projects that have micro units, and I'm actually going to talk about one here in a minute that we're announcing today, um, which I'm really excited about. But, you know, we're working on a couple of these, and and they're incredibly popular. I mean, there's one that's actually in East Nashville called the Shops on Fatherland, and it's kind of this, you know, almost incubator-style development where, you know, they've got these smaller suites available. And, man, I swear they have over 97% occupancy all the time. Because the units are, you know, 400 square feet, give or take. Um, you've got some bigger ones on the street. You've got some smaller ones in the back. But, you know, it's affordable for people to go test out their projects or, you know, for them to go open a second location in East Nashville or, or you know, whatever that may be. And it just makes it attainable, right? And so it's, it's really interesting to see 
um, how that's happening because it's not just office space. You know, you've got, yeah, sure, you're getting micro units in office space, but you're getting micro units in retail as well. Um, you're getting micro units in restaurants, and that's actually what, what we're uh, going to announce today. So if you are following us live, you'll actually see um, some of the images here um, for a project that I'm doing called The Wash, uh, which is a car wash conversion. It's a, so I bought this um, in early December. But it's a six-bay car wash in East Nashville, and it is uh, it had kind of fallen apart. And this is a pure COVID uh, development. But essentially, uh, we were looking at it going, you know, what, what can we possibly do with this? We thought about micro office units. We thought about micro retail units. Nothing ever really made sense until COVID hit, and I started getting calls from these restaurant groups saying, hey, look, we want something under 1,000 square feet. Are there any restaurants in Nashville you know, available for lease under 1,000 square feet? Well, the answer was always no. I mean, there's just nothing like that. And then you know, I started thinking about this project and, and called my partner Jamie on it, and I said, hey, man, what do you think about this? And he was like, that's brilliant. I actually had plans for another car wash like five or 10 years ago to do this exact same thing, and so it just clicked. So this development is we're converting the six bays into micro restaurants. They're essentially retail facing ghost kitchens. So it's, it's very, I mean, you know, we're taking on ghost kitchens and micro units into one project and uh, that's, it's being announced today, but um, we've already got three of the six bays committed, um, which is, you know, incredibly exciting, but it gives these chefs um, like we were talking about earlier, an opportunity to come out and test their concept. It's kind of that halfway step between, you know, having an idea and spending, you know, six figures on a build out. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's really exciting to see, um, you know, what we've got going on there. I can't wait to, for that one to get out in the world and, and, and see what happens. Nate, <laughs> yeah. Nate Williams, genius. Hey, and by the Thank way, you, I heard a key word that you used in there and I just want to bring it up to people to make sure they understand. You said the word partner and it didn't, it was not followed with Bruce Peterson. Oh yeah. Bruce I wasn't invited you. into this deal. I, <laughs> I hate you. I want to be part of everything. <laughs> I love Jamie. I, you guys are going to kill it with that project. Yeah. I, well, I appreciate it. Well, Hey, at least, at least you and I will be managing it. So we've got that. Yep. And we're doing our own micro stuff that we talked about last week at, at the provisionary. So yeah, we've got our stuff going on too. That's right. Uh, yeah, Bruce and I are actually looking at buying the office immediately next door to put to put our property management company in, which is a little bit of a selfish move because then we'll be able to walk next door to six micro restaurants that'll probably be some of the coolest concepts in the city. So I'm excited about that. Yep. <clears throat> but so that's it for uh, for ghost kitchens, micro units. Um, you know, the next thing is last mile distribution. Bruce, are you, are you familiar at all with with last mile distribution? Well, I am because of what you hear on the news all the time. You know, CNBC talks about it a lot. But yeah, from what I understand, right, it's just people are shipping things all over the place. Everybody, everybody's getting everything delivered now. And it's one thing to load 4,000 tons of stuff in a 747 or on a, uh, a train or a ship. But eventually, as it gets closer and closer and closer to the end deliver uh, the, the end delivery, that's what they're talking about that with that last mile. That is, I think, the most expensive part of the entire chain. That's that's absolutely right. So, you know, it, you think about uh, like last mile delivery didn't become a thing until Amazon started doing two day shipping. Then it became a big deal for them to have, you know, the whatever gets ordered the most sitting in a warehouse close so that they can they can very quickly get it to your house became an even bigger deal when they started doing same day shipping. And so, you know, last mile distribution, it's, it's literally what it is the last mile before it gets to the consumer's home. And, you know, this is often where they have, you know, the smaller trucks come and pick stuff up and go to your neighborhood to drop it off. Um, you know, that you've got these massive distribution facilities. We've got one, you know, about 45 minutes outside of Nashville for Amazon, about a million square feet. Um, and so, you know, those will actually ship to these last mile distribution facilities. And then from there, it goes to the homes. So, you know, you think about cities like Nashville um, and why last mile is becoming so important. Um, one, you know, it Nashville doesn't have mass transit. So we've got bad traffic. 
Um, it's not nearly as bad as Atlanta uh, or L.A., but it is definitely starting to creep up. And so you think about how much time it could actually take, um, how much wasted man hours you would have of somebody just sitting in traffic, you know, trying to deliver packages. So that becomes crucial. But also, Nashville doesn't have a whole lot of industrial left in the core. You know, it's it's all been torn down um, or redeveloped uh, into more profitable uses. Industrial just can't afford to pay as much. So, you know, the, the last mile distribution is becoming more and more in demand. So it'll be interesting to see, you know, as online shopping, uh, you know, continues to grow, how, how last mile distribution will continue to grow. I mean, industrial has absolutely killed it this cycle. I mean, absolutely crushed it. Yeah, that's interesting. And soon you're going to be seeing all the drones flying through the air by Amazon and dropping stuff at your door. So, you know, that's part of that, you know, progress that we've talked about, too, that, man, things. What is it? Moore's law that everything doubles every 18 months. Uh, oh, yeah. Speed, capacity, everything. The march of tr technology is just amazing. But, you know, with that last mile you're talking about, you know, if you've got a way to develop some industrial space, some warehouse space, that's probably, you're the commercial broker, you'll know this better than I, but you would think there'd be a huge demand for that. It's, I mean, it's massive. I mean, there's this giant warehouse that was just, I mean, it's not giant compared to a million square feet, but Amazon took a, a warehouse near downtown that's their last mile distribution hub. And it is amazing to, I've, I've driven past it before, during the package pickup hour, which I'm sure is probably all the time. Um, but man, there were, there was a line of cars. I would say it was probably a half mile long of, of these vans. And you think about how inefficient that is. I mean, they, they're probably looking for another warehouse so that they can more easily just load up these trucks and go faster with it. So there's a massive demand for it. And, you know, the other thing too, is that, if you can build any sort of industrial or flex near a downtown core, I, I almost guarantee, I'm not your broker, but I almost guarantee that you will have that lease before it is fully finished. Because you think about all, so this cycle has been fully focused on distribution for industrial. There hasn't been a whole lot of flex space that's been built. Well, there are still plumbers, electricians, you know, all of these other smaller, you know, maybe, um, e-commerce businesses that still need a little office space with some warehousing and, you know, they need to ship out too and they don't have really good options. So, you know, that has also grown significantly this cycle. I mean, we've seen the lowest vacancy rates out of any property have been in an in industrial, um, which is pretty, pretty fascinating. <clears throat> That's really cool. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, the, the last thing on there was prop tech and honestly, I'm not the most, uh, most well-versed in prop tech. I've got a buddy of mine, um, Nate, I'm going to have to get him. His name's Nate Smoyer. Um, I'm going to have to get him on the show to come talk about prop tech. Cause he loves that. He actually used to have a podcast on prop tech, but if you don't know what prop tech is, it is property technology and commercial real estate, multifamily real estate, multifamily, not as much as commercial. It's like stuck in the 1980s, man. I mean, there's just, there hasn't been a whole lot of technological advancements in maintaining and operating investments and, and buildings. And so, you know, that's a, a very rapidly growing trend is prop tech. So what kind of softwares can you use to more efficiently run a building? Because, you know, again, if you can, you know, like Bruce was saying earlier on multifamily, if you can eliminate an assistant manager and you can have a software program that's running all the time, that's, you know, on AI predicting, you know, which HVAC unit will blow out next, I mean, you can just more efficiently run a property. There are technologies that monitor HVAC usage, and they'll say, okay, well, between this time and this time, there's less movement in the building. Fewer doors are opening and letting air out, so we can actually turn down how much power we're using on HVAC units. Um, it's really interesting to see you know, the kinds of advancements there. Have you been following any of that at all? Have you seen anything like that? Not really. The only thing that we do, you know, talking about technology, um, not necessarily AI, but I'm very interested for the day that solar becomes uh, doable, right? Because it's really not cost effective right now. I've looked into it a few times, 
but you know we've got the the image amazon storage lockers uh they're expensive but they free up time from your uh from your on-site staff having to go get packages all the time just think there's more and more and more and more packages being delivered every single day you need more space to store them there's more people coming in and out of the office people don't want to come in out in and out of the office because of covid so there's a lot of reasons that those package delivery systems or basically those lockers are really doing well um other than that you know the tech that we're seeing is you know very specific to the units you're seeing smart lighting you're seeing smart doorbells and thermostats and you know we provide on all of our properties on an a la carte basis only when they want it we don't roll it out throughout the entire properties um but if you want a ring doorbell we we provide that to you if you want a smart thermostat we provide that to you um we have the Google Assistant. You have the Amazon Alexa that we throw in if they get those pieces from us. We have smart door locks that when you walk up to your door, if you set it up properly in your phone on the app, it there's a proximity sensor. So it's working on Bluetooth. When you get close to the door, it knows you're there. And if you set it this way, it will unlock itself for you so you can walk in, don't have to dig for your keys. And that's really important if you have the right kind of door handle with like a lever door handle instead of a knob and you got your hands full of groceries, it feels you come up, it unlocks itself, and with your elbow, you could probably open up your door and push it in with your knee. So, you know, there's some really, really cool stuff going on there. I know there's smart leak detection systems that are th uh, rolling out throughout the market. So there is a fair amount on our side as well. That's brilliant. I mean, I would argue there's probably more going on in the multifamily world. It, you know, multifamilies always just seem to be far more advanced than commercial but that's, uh, I didn't know that you could do that, that, that there were um, doorknobs like that that just sense the Bluetooth and open. That's genius. Oh, it's, it's amazing. If you set it the right way, too, when you drive away from your house or from your apartment, it can sense when you're a certain distance away and it automatically locks it for you. So, you know, there's no way to forget to lock your door. And even if you do and you don't have it set to do that, you can still lock your door and unlock your door remotely. You can create passcodes for renters if it's an Airbnb type setup. Um, if you have guests coming over and you don't, you you won't always be there when they're there. They're coming and going. You're coming and going. You can give them access codes to let themselves in. So yeah, it's incredible. That that's one of the coolest pieces of tech that I've seen in a while. We haven't rolled out any kind of like uh, the Nest cameras and that kind of thing because that feels a little intrusive. If uh, residents want to get their own cameras, totally fine. I don't want them to think that, oh, maybe somebody's watching me. So we'll, we're probably never going to provide that kind of stuff ourselves. Yeah, that's probably a good idea. But that's that's really fascinating. We should explore uh, doing those those door handles with our with our office space. We'll have to talk about that offline a little bit. Um, OK, so those are the trends that we see for commercial real estate going on in 2021, um, commercial and multifamily. Bruce, what markets do you think are going to, you know, should everybody keep an eye on? Well, it's the same thing that's been going on for a while. You're looking for any state that's landlord friendly, first of all. Now, again, I'm speaking specifically to multifamily, but you're looking for states that are landlord friendly, that people can't sit there in your unit for two years waiting on the eviction process to play out. Again, you don't want to evict anybody, but sometimes you have to. Um, so that's what you're looking for. But the migration seems to be south and primarily southeast. You have a lot of migration going into Arizona um nevada but you know it's primarily you've got georgia tennessee alabama florida texas that's where the migration seems to be coming from the coastal cities they're going there they want warmer climates they don't want to deal with snow um a lot of the the states in the south don't have state income taxes texas doesn't florida doesn't i know for a fact um so i think that's where you're going you're looking for places though Kind of a more macro conversation you're looking for that's where they're migrating to but you're also looking for places that are going to have growing uh, cities the population is growing they're not leaving you're looking for places that have w wage growth and job growth a personal favorite of mine i'm looking for cities that have a big tech industry a big startup community they tend to draw younger people that make more money so i really like that a lot um keep an eye on uh, crime always that goes without saying but that's kind of what I think about when I'm trying to choose a market myself. Yeah, I uh, it, it's it's not really surprising to see that the Southeast is absolutely crushing it right now. I mean, that includes you know think think about um, Nashville, Tennessee, Austin, Texas. 
Uh, Dallas is actually doing really well as well, even though they're it's already massive. Um, Raleigh, Durham, North Carolina, um, Charlotte is also doing really well. Uh, you know, Nashville and Austin are both states in, uh, or I'm sorry, they're both cities in states that have no state income tax, and so that's massive. That's why Nashville and Austin are getting so much of the the exodus uh, from California. Um, you know, my, I think that you know, pay attention to these high tax urban centers. Uh, you know, New York City. Chicago, L.A., San Francisco, they're, they've become very uh, unfriendly to landlords. And so it's, it's difficult to make any sense out of that. I mean, we're, we're dealing with a lot of investors that are moving out of there, um, out of those cities and into Nashville. And I, I would imagine you're seeing the exact same thing in Austin. You know, Tesla just announced that they're moving to Austin. Oracle's moving to Austin. Those are two massive companies that are leaving California. Um, for a state with no state income tax. So I, I think that'll be big. Um, so I actually, uh, I'm going to screen share this too, if you're watching with us live. Um, I'll actually, I will link uh, this in the video description below and leave it in the show notes too, if you're listening on the podcast. But um, we wrote an article uh, based on our market knowledge and data from PwC and the Urban Land Institute on commercial real estate investing in 2021. So the trends, markets, outlooks, if you want to dive into that a little bit further about what Bruce and I've been talking about here today. Um, definitely, definitely check that out. So Bruce, what do you, what do you think is the future of commercial and multifamily real estate? Oh, it, it looks incredibly bright. I think it looks brighter than most things that I could put my money into. That's why almost all of my money keeps going into this. Um, you know, I, I still have a little bit in the stock market, but man, I don't, again, I don't see values going down uh, anytime soon. You know, I don't see anything like 2008, 2009, because 2008, 2009, that was real estate centric. That was lending. That was real estate. This this coronavirus thing is not really it doesn't have anything to do with housing. Now, we are being impacted by it, but it's not a housing issue. It's not a real estate issue. It's just getting, you know, seeing some impact from it. So I think we're going to keep growing. I think prices are going to keep going up. Your returns will stay the same. They may even go a little lower. But again, when you start comparing it to other investment opportunities and options, I still think it's one of the best, if not the best options for regular people that don't have billions of dollars they can throw into a hedge fund or, you know, some of the private equity firms that are investing in, you know, alternative investments. Real estate is, it's basically attainable for almost anybody. Now, not everybody has twenty five to $50,000. But a lot of people do. And so I think you're going to keep seeing people pour money into this industry. Uh, prices keep going up. Returns, like I said, I hope they stay stable. As long as as they go down, if they do, it's still there's still that risk reward uh, calculus involved. Yep, exactly. I mean, it's, you know, it's it's amazing how well commercial real estate has performed throughout COVID, honestly. I mean, despite all of the volatility in the markets, commercial real estate's done really well it's not only held strong it's it's actually grown in demand because i think people are so tired of seeing the volatility in the markets that they're moving their money into into alternative investment classes which commercial and multifamily real estate are one of those um you know my thoughts are that you know retail retail will continue to adapt i mean big box of course that's dying but you look at neighborhood retail and, and micro units and, and the opportunities that that provides the retail market there is plenty of stuff that is covid proof Right. I mean, you know, you've, you've just got to be intentional about it and, and make sure that what you're providing is what the market wants as far as what retail goes. So I think retail will be just fine. Office space is going nowhere. I, I, I don't I don't see, um, you know, there's been a whole lot of talk over the last you know nine months that, you know, office is dead. Everybody's going to work from home from now on. You'll never go into the office ever again. And, you know, people who, who write those articles, they they're just you know, jumping on the train, they want the traffic. It's just, it's not even remotely true. Um, you know, maybe some of these bigger companies, they, they're, they're trying to figure out a way to outsource a lot of the stuff that they don't want people coming into the office for. But you can't tell me that, you know, Bridgestone is just going to all of a sudden never go into their building again. Um, or that Amazon is just never going to go into the building again. I mean, you can't create an office culture. You can't create a team um, if you're not, if you're not face to face. And think about how lonely people would get or how crazy you would be, I mean, just being home all day. I, I mean, I've had to do that because, you know, I had a COVID scare last week, so I had to, you know, isolate myself and work from home until I got my negative re test results. 
But I mean, man, that was miserable just having to work from home and, you know, not getting to interact with anybody. Um, industrial, of course, is going to stay so strong. I mean, you know, as, as e-commerce continues to grow, there's no way that industrial has anywhere else to go but up. And, you know, like Bruce said, multifamily, I mean, multifamily is doing super well. I mean, it's doing really, really well. And, you know, another thing that I think we didn't even really touch on is multifamily conversions. I have a feeling there's going to be a lot of hotels that close down because of this that will get converted into micro, you know, multifamily units. Right. So our latest onboarded uh, client in Nashville actually is exactly that. It was a it was a motel, not a hotel, but it was a motel that they converted into apartment uh, units. And they're, you know, roughly 250 square feet. And we talked about micro units all the time. You know, we just took over management of it, you know, within 30 days. It's not been 30 days yet. And we're already leasing it. Right. We took it over pretty much empty, but we've all already signed multiple leases. It's leasing well. People are looking for it. You know, they they want more affordable. So, yeah, I think you're going to start seeing, like you said, a lot of the motels that are going away as as areas of town start to transition. They're usually transitioning from being kind of a, a lesser part of town. People, you know, with not a lot of money are there and not to denigrate anybody in any way. But it's areas that's been neglected. So you have a lot of this old, old, old uh, motel stuff. And it doesn't always have the best tenants. So people are coming into these transitioning areas and it's helping it transition even more, buying those and converting them into, first of all, cleaning them up, making them much, much nicer, but now turning them into true apartments instead of no tell motel kind of things where you rent by the hour, wink, wink, you know, this is my daughter, this is my wife, this is my aunt. Well, no, it, it's your professional that you've hired for the night. You know, we're getting a lot of that stuff out by doing this. It's part of the transition. A lot of people don't like the gentrification, everybody calls it. Well, gentrification, I know it does take up property values for people that have lived there for decades. And I'm mindful of that. I get it. But the gentrification cleans up and makes neighborhoods safer. So I, I understand the people that have been there for a while and they're, they hate it. They might be priced out of their home. And I feel terrible for those people. But again, when we're doing this, we're cleaning up places, reducing crime, making it prettier, uh, making it more walkable and safer at night, too. So, yeah, there, there's a lot of that going on right now. Yeah, I mean, two of the largest hotels in Nashville downtown hit the market this past week, um, which, you know, it's not surprising. I mean, hospitality has taken a massive hit during COVID. So it'll be interesting to see how that shakes out. I, would, I have a feeling that there's some multifamily conversion guys that are looking at that. Um, right. you know, cause they, they, I mean, they're downtown, they would make great apartment units. I mean, who wouldn't, who wouldn't want to lease that? Well, that's awesome. Bruce, do you have any final parting words for 2021 outlook that, you know, people should keep in mind when they're out there looking at deals? You know, the only thing that I would really say is don't, you know, don't be the ostrich with your head in the sand. Don't hide from coronavirus. Don't hide from reality. Quit listening to all the bullshit you hear on TV. Some of it's real, some of it's, but most of it's sensationalized, right? Uh, we're not talking about Republican, Democrat, Fox, MSNBC. We're not talking about that. Just keep your brain straight. Keep your eye forward. And just, you know, don't get wrapped up in all the hysteria and all the vitriol that's out there and all the anger that's on the airwaves. Just take care of you. Make your work on your mind, right? For those that are being negatively impacted, um, Different sectors of the, the economy are changing. Different um, companies are going out of business. Uh, whole sectors are maybe changing or going out of business. Take this time to make yourself better, more employable, get yourself more skills that you can adapt and pivot into very often higher paying jobs because they're higher skilled jobs. So that's it. Just, just keep your head about you. Don't get too depressed. Keep going. It's going to work out. I promise it'll work out. We'll get through this. We're almost through it. We get through everything. Yep. I think that's great advice. Well, so on, uh, on my Instagram, I posted a, uh, you know, one of those questions and, and had people reach out and ask a bunch of questions uh, about uh, just investing. So you, are you ready for some uh, kind of rapid fire Q and a let's do it. I don't let's know do how it. rapid it's going to be. Some of these will probably be very <laughs> questions, but oh, yeah, let's go. That's totally fine. 
Um, okay, so analyzing deals and cap rates, how are you how are you looking at that now moving into 2021? Well, we talked about that really already. That cap rates are going down. And when I'm assessing deals, if I'm going to assume that cap rates are going to go uh, down, see, again, it gets weird. When you're underwriting, you're trying to be very conservative and try to make sure you don't make too many risky assumptions. We think cap rates will continue to go down, and they probably will. But if you buy something at a four cap and you don't plan or you don't have a plan for cap rates going up, logic says that, well, cap rates kind of have to go up, don't they? Well, they don't have to, but you better be prepared in case they do. So what I've heard over the last five years is probably the biggest consensus I can find is every year you own a property, you have to assume an expansion in cap rates of about 0.15 to 0.25 whole points, right? So 15 to 25 basis points in cap rate expansion. If cap rates continue to go down as you own, oh my Lord, you're gonna dance in the streets, you're gonna be happy, but you have to prepare for all things that you can. You can't prepare for everything, but you have to be smart when you underwrite and assume that cap rates are gonna go up. That That's the biggest thing for me. Don't get sucked into, oh, cap rates can only go down. They will only go down. That's the only, that's not true. It's probably going to happen, but in case it, if, if your whole investment thesis is based on the fact that cap rates have to go down or we don't make money, you better not do that deal because they probably will go down, but there's a chance they won't. Yeah, I think that's great. I mean, it, we always assume cap rates are going to be relatively conservative whenever we dispose because you you just you have no idea what the market's going to look like. It, the the interest rate environment can completely change. Um, should you raise capital before you find a deal? Oh my lord, that's I get that <laughs> all the time. You know, everybody thinks that. Well, no, no, no. You have to find a deal because then you have something to present to people. No, that's completely ass backwards. It, it's totally backwards especially if you do your syndication. So this question assumes that you're going to raise money from other people. If you're going to do a syndication, most of you that have never done one, especially you're going to do it in a way within the SEC regulations that you can only have people invested with you that you know and have a pre-existing relationship. If you don't have a pre-existing relationship with them, you can't send them a deal. So think about that. I find a deal and then I go start raising money. Well, if you haven't started raising money already and getting soft commits from people, well, you haven't established a pre-existing relationship. So if I find a deal today, I can't go to people that I don't know or people that I meet at a conference or a meetup and say, hey, you want to invest in my deal? It's against the law. You can't do it. So if you find a deal, you now can't raise money. Within your due diligence period, you're going to have to pull the plug because you couldn't raise the money because now you got yourself stuck because you're listening to your syndication attorney and doing it the right way. So now you got to get out of the deal. Okay, well, but Bruce, I'll get all my earnest money back. Okay, you're right. You will get all your earnest money back. But think about the bridges you're burning with the uh, with the brokers. You know, you took a property offline for 30 days while you looked at it potentially, and then you had to pull the plug. You do that enough times. No broker is going to talk to you ever again because you're wasting people's time. So always, always, always raise money first. Yep. I think that's a great question. And also to clarify, that is for a 506B offering. You have to have right. that pre-existing relationship. Uh, Bruce and I are starting to get into 506C offerings, which uh, you don't have to have that pre-existing relationship, but you can only accept money from accredited investors. So um you know, that, which has its pros and cons, right? I mean, if you're going through your first capital raise, a 506C is going to be far more difficult uh, than a 506B. So, uh, you know, that's obviously a conversation you want to have with your attorney, um, of which Bruce and I are neither. So we are not, we are not your attorney. Exactly. Um, Bruce, what happens if, if an investor wants to pull out their money before the assigned close date uh, for the investment? How do you handle that? Okay, before the close date, okay, you can do that. <clears throat> Excuse me. You're not fully in the deal technically. So two things usually have to happen. You have to, to be clear, sent Sorry, to, to clarify, not the not the close date for the raise, the close date for the project. So if I've raised on a five-year deal and an investor wants their money out in year three, how do you handle that? Oh, okay. Okay. Totally different conversation. So yep. let's say, yeah, you've already, you've raised money. You've, well, as an investor, you've put your money into a deal that has been bought now 
the offering technically is closed because they stopped raising money and everybody that's in is in. That's it. Somebody wants out before the property sells or before the capital event, you know, they get bought out of the deal, which is very common. Um, well, good luck is all I can tell you. There are uh, liquidity <laughs> provisions in most deals that say you can get out early for these specific reasons and these specific reasons only. So there's a couple of things here. First of all, as far as I'm aware, all syndications that uh, avoid full registration with the SEC, and that's what a 506B is, a 506C is, it's a regulation D exemption from full registration. If the syndication is done in that way, investors are not allowed to transfer ownership of their shares, sold or not, within the first 12 months, period. They're not allowed to. Because if you do that within the first 12 months, you run the risk of the, uh, of the deal having to be fully registered now with the SEC because you didn't play by the rules. So for the most part, you cannot get your money out within the first 12 months. But then after that, the next two, three, four years, whatever, you will have clauses that say you can get out for these reasons, mental incapacity, um, bankruptcy, um, divorce, maybe death, obviously. So there are ways to get out, but it's complicated. Outside of those ways, it's usually going to come down to you have to find, well, first of all, with our, our deals, I have right of first refusal as the deal sponsor. If I don't want all of that offering, let's say I want to buy half of their shares. Well, then the other half will go out to the, the rest of the partnership first. Anybody want this? No, nobody wants it. Okay. So now Mr. or Mrs. Investor, it's up to you to go find a suitable buyer outside somewhere. My deals always say, if that's the case, fine. But now this new person has to be voted on and approved by the rest of the partnership. And if they don't get approved, well, you're stuck. You have to go into these knowing they are highly illiquid. It's possible to get your money back out, but it's very hard. It's very unlikely, but you probably can. You've got to read your documents to see their, uh, their liquidity provisions. Uh, not everybody has them. Make sure your attorney looks at them too so you understand exactly what you're getting yourself into. Yeah, I mean, we make sure to address that on the very front end with all of our investors. Like, look, there's you know, there's not really an easy way for you to get your money out. So once you put it in, you're committed. And, you know, we're here, we're here to, to finalize this deal together. So, right. And once you sign those documents, you know, and then three years down the line go, Oh, well, I, I didn't know I couldn't get my money out. So I just, I didn't know. So you got, well, that's your fault. You signed the documents. I didn't put a gun to your head and make you sign a document. You <laughs> signed it because you decided not to read it. Maybe I can't help you. You know, it. we will govern the whole thing by what the documents say. That's it. I've had a lot of people tell me, oh, Bruce, I didn't read your documents. I get so mad because you're going to create problems for yourself and me potentially in the future. So please read your documents. Yeah, I mean, nobody should ever sign a legally binding contract without at least having their attorney review it. Yeah, maybe you don't need to, to read through it and understand it, but at least have your attorney look at it. Exactly. Um, Awesome. Well, that is it for this episode on commercial real estate trends, markets, and outlook for 2021. Uh, appreciate you guys joining us. And uh, we will be live next Monday at 10 a.m. Um, and then after that, we'll be back to our regular times at Friday at 10 a.m., right? Yep. See you guys Monday. Awesome. See you guys.